Um, so thank you very much for everybody that has joined us today. It's really, really great to see you all here and so excited to hear about beneficial insects uh, in this research updates webinar. If you haven't met us before, Caesar Australia are a, an independent research company and we specialise in integrated pest management, conservation and biosecurity. And Pest Facts Southeastern is an element, one of the projects that we run. And we're all about keeping growers and advisors such as yourselves informed about invertebrate pests, uh, beneficials uh, in crops and pastures during the winter cropping season, but also across the year. Um, this is part of at the IPM for Grains project, the Run Through Caesar, which is an investment of the GRDC. And we run that along with our partners, DPIRD, SADI, QDAF, and New South Wales DPI. So today, just a little bit of housekeeping. We'd love you to introduce yourself via the chat if you're interested. We always love to hear who's on board and who's um, joining us today. You can also use this chat for questions throughout the webinar, um, which we will answer at the end. We'll have the opportunity for discussion then. And also just to let you know, this session is being recorded so that we will be able to share it again online. So what have we got in store for you today? We are talking about beneficial insects, which a lots of people are really excited about, and I am too. We've got two wonderful researchers from CESAR here with us today, Dr. Sam Ward, who's going to be telling us about her research on aphid parasitoids, and Dr. Robert um, McDougall, who is talking about pesticide toxicity on some natural enemies, which is exciting new research as well. So Robert, uh, sorry, Sam, I'll hand it over to you to begin with and I'll stop sharing. You can share your screen. Thank you very much. Okay, so can you all see my screen? Wonderful. All right, thanks for that, Lizzie. Uh, hello everyone and welcome. Um, thanks for attending my talk. So I'm going to talk to you today about aphid parasitoids in Australian grains. And this presentation was part of my PhD that I undertook at the University of Melbourne. It was funded by the GRDC and taken in collaboration with CESAR Australia. So what is a beneficial? It's a rather vague and woolly concept. So when we talk about beneficial organisms in general, it's anything benefiting agriculture and gardening. This can include pollinators, pest control, seed spreading, which could include birds and mammals, or companion, companion planting, which doesn't even involve animals at all. But what we mean here in terms of beneficials is in the context of pest control. So this can involve predators, parasitoids and pathogenic fungi. But why are these important? Now, I'm probably preaching to the choir here, but beneficial organisms can be used within integrated pest management strategies, in turn reducing unnecessary chemical sprays, which is of course great for the environment. But I'm really interested in parasitoids. So I've talked about beneficials as a whole, but parasitoids is just one section of beneficial organisms. Now, parasitoids are unlike parasites because parasites don't kill their host during their development. Think likes and ticks, you know, in your hair and not nice. Uh, they can parasitize at multiple life stages. However, parasitoids generally parasitize as larvae. In an adult form, they can be predators or they can feed on nectar, but they parasitize as larvae. They're very selective selecting particular species or life stage or stages. It's usually only the females that are involved in host utilization. And this includes things like ichneumonid wasps that parasitize moths and butterflies and kinid flies. Now, parasitoids can be wasps, beetles, flies, but I'm really interested in parasitoid hymenoptera, so the wasps. And it has been argued, although if there's any beetle taxonomists out there, it's a heated debate, uh, that there are more parasitoid hymenoptera than beetle species. But so many are undescribed that we just don't know the extent to what's out there. So because this is so vast, I'm just gonna focus on the aphid parasitoids. And you might know parasitoids in the context of primary parasitoids. And for aphids that includes aphidines, like this top picture up here, or aphalinids, 
And these are wasps that lay their eggs or oviposit their eggs into aphids. The larvae of the wasp then develops, eating the inside of the aphid, causing a husk-like appearance when the outside hardens. And this gives you your stereotypical mummy that you see here. It can be golden, black, brown, very dependent on the species of, of wasp. But just to confuse matters, you also have secondary parasitoids. And these fall into two camps. So you have your mummy parasitoids and your hyperparasitoids. Now, mummy parasitoids attack an already formed mummy, paralyzing whatever wasp might be developing inside there. And that can be a primary or a secondary wasp. And they develop instantaneously. But you also have your hyperparasitoids. And they attack before that mummy has formed when there's already a wasp growing inside. They lay their eggs inside that primary parasitoid that's developing and delay their development until the mummy begins to form. And that includes things such as Alloxista, the genus of this wasp down in the bottom there. But what do we know about aphid parasitoids in Australia? Well, the short answer is not an awful lot. The long answer is, and I've taken this as a screenshot from a previous presentation, that there's a huge complex of parasitoids associated with aphids alone. Now you have over 100, around 100 species of aphid that are of economic significance as crop pests. And for each of those aphid species, you have this whole network of parasitoids. So you have your primary parasitoids at the top there, and then a whole group of different secondary parasitoids. And so you could spend your whole life researching these. And I decided to focus on grain aphids, and one particular group of parasitoids, the primary parasitoids, aphidiny or aphidines. And I wanted to ask, what aphidine species do we have in Australia? What are the geographic ranges of each of these species? And how do they interact with their aphid host and plant host? And so this was a huge project. Um, I noticed Lee's with us today and she's seen this presentation a number of times, so she'll know, she knows what's involved. Uh, but it was a whole big group of uh, GRDC um, related people. We had agronomists, growers, uh, government departments involved, and we did a lot of opportunistic sampling around Australia uh, between the years of 2016 and 19. I also undertook some repeat sampling over a couple of years in Victoria. And also we undertook myself and a few other people uh, some repeat sampling in four different states. I also undertook a trip to Tasmania, uh, which was to fill in some research gaps and a nice little holiday as well. Uh, and you can see here that I undertook some yellow pan trapping, vacuum sampling, and we did some bi-directional flight interception traps, which is in the top left up here. I also drew on museums and insect collections for historically collected uh, insects there. Uh, and also citizen science. And I, I can't stress enough the importance of citizen science. You might have heard of Atlas of Living Australia. Uh, I pulled a couple of databases and looked at uh, different um, some, uh, sightings of different parasitoids and it was great for geographic uh, distribution. And so what did I find? Well, of the 5,500 individuals that I collected and identified, in total, including those historic samples, I got 23 different species. So I can show you in this pie chart here, this small uh, light blue segment is actually all of the other species combined so that I've got here. And of those that I personally collected, I found 11 different species. But very interestingly uh, and unexpectedly, we found 72%, so almost three quarters of those collected were this, this big blue wedge here. Uh, was one particular species called Diarotella rapi. I mean, the name is pretty irrelevant, it doesn't matter, but it was just one main species. Um, and this, this is unlike other studies that we found abroad. Um, a lot of uh, international studies have found a lot more uh, of a range uh, of species that were found. But Diarotella rapi is very cosmopolitan. It's found around the world um, and it was recorded about a century ago in Australia. So it's been here for a little while. But the reason this is interesting is because international travel is commonplace, maybe not so, so much nowadays, uh, but also international trade. So a lot of parasitoids come into the country and out of the country as mummies on exported or imported plants or on persons. Now, the reason that 
the number of species is so low is likely because the vast majority of our research was undertaken in grain crops and even more specifically in canola crops. And so it would be expected that you wouldn't have as much um, diversity there. And so I decided to map the distribution of all these different aphidines. Now you'll see it's a bit, a bit of a lot of information really on, on one slide, but there's all that list of different parasitoids and you'll see that generally their presence correlates with the grain belt. Now, obviously this is where the canola paddocks are. So most of our sampling was undertaken here, but also it's where most of the preferred host plants are. And the climate plays a massive role in this. It's a lot cooler, there's a lot more rainfall. So it's just a lot nicer really for those, um, those parasitoids to live. But I decided to split the different parasitoids into groups and looked at the main three species to see their distribution. So the main one, Diratella rapi, that I've already mentioned, you can see here goes all the way up quite high into Queensland. It's also found in Tasmania. And interestingly, it's one of the only species that's found on the Eyre Peninsula of South Australia. But if you look at the next most commonly caught species, Aphidius colmani, that a lot of biological control companies you'll know um, produce, uh, the range is a lot narrower. So it was very commonly found, but it all seemed to be really within quite a small range. And then if you look at the next one, Aphidius ervi, which again is one that you might be familiar with, it's a lot more commonly found in Tasmania, not at all in Queensland. Now that's not to say it's not there, it most likely is, uh, but the fact that it's so much lower in the country is likely due to its higher threshold for lower temperatures than say Aphidius colmani that was on the previous slide. And I'll quickly uh, mention the taxonomy. Um, it might not be too relevant to you, but I created as well a, a user-friendly illustrated key for the identification of these aphid parasitoids. And often it boils down to, do they have an extra segment uh, on the, the palps of their mouth and things? So it's much of a muchness when you see them. And certainly if you see them out in the paddock, they're all gonna look the same. It's until you get them under the microscope that they look different. But something that might be a little bit more of interest is the host associations. So Diratella rapi was this most commonly found species, but you'll see here in this graph that it's the dark, um, the dark gray color of these bars that you've got your cabbage aphid here, your green peach aphid just above, and then up here you have your turnip aphids. So Diratella rapi really dominated brassica aphid parasitism which is interesting because it didn't just, it's known as the cabbage aphid parasitoid because it's supposedly around the world parasitizes cabbage aphid above anything else. But we found here actually, I mean, it, it, proportionally, yes, it did, um, but it, it parasitized all brassica aphids really well. Whereas Lisa flevis testicipes, which is a mouthful and a half, another species of parasitoid was very commonly found in wheat paddocks. Interestingly, I found very few parasitoids in wheat paddocks. Um, this could be just because it was harder to sample them. They're often within sheaths of the wheat, uh, but it just didn't seem to be as common as canola. But they really enjoyed par parasitizing uh, Russian wheat aphid that you can see here, it's the brown bar, and corn aphid up here as well. So again, it didn't seem to be the, the aphid themselves that they were interested in. It was more to do with the, the crop that the aphids were on. So plant hosts play a huge role. This is also extended to, uh, in Queensland, we were sampling green peach aphid and found only to rear Aphidius colmani, not Diratella rapi as expected in a lot of the other states. Now, we don't think that's anything really to do with the state. Climate probably plays a role, but it was more likely because we reared the parasitoids from broccoli. And so Again, it's the plant host, vo plant volatiles play, play a huge role in the parasitoid preference and choice and their enticement into an area. And Diratella rapi really likes brassicas. But just also to mention about host plants down here in this table that you can see, these are the list of parasitoids that we found. And you can see the number of host aphids that they attacked. But even more interestingly, if you look at the number of host plants, there was even more variation in host plants than there were in host aphids. So it was an even greater range that was often attacked. Now, usually with international literature, you find that most aphid parasitoids focus on one or two aphids. 
But we found here at Dirotella rapi, that most common parasitoid, actually was found to attack six different host aphids and nine different host plants. So we might have a smaller range of parasitoids in Australia than expected, or certainly within the grains um, area, but they've obviously evolved to parasitize a lot of different aphids, which is great news. But what does this mean? Well, they all parasitize aphids, right? Does it really matter? Well, it does matter. We need to know what we've got out there in terms of how we can control them, benefit them, uh, enhance their ability to parasitize our pests. Now, the lower diversity than expected is slightly unusual, but as I say, they've obviously evolved to parasitize a wide range of aphids, which is fantastic. We do need to, I will say as well, we do need to do further work in different areas. So as I say, most of this work was undertaken in grains crops, but it would be very interesting to pull on horticultural crops in forests. You'll likely have other aphid parasitoids there. But some of the advice I can give really is leaving suitable host plants adjacent to crops. This will encourage parasitoid and of course predator presence. And as a bit of a side um, note, uh, another chapter of my PhD, we were sampling shelter belts and grassy refuges that bordered canola and wheat paddocks. And you'll see in these bottom four pie charts here, this is just the wheat. So the wheat paddocks at the top and the wheat edges. So I've combined the shelter belts and the grassy refuges together here. And you'll see that they're just, if you're just looking at the colors, the species is really irrelevant, uh, that there's a lot of overlap in terms of the species present in both paddock and the edges. Now you've got more in the paddock, but there's a lot of overlap. However, if you go up to these top four pie charts, if you look at the canola paddocks, you'll see, I mean, the blue is the Dirotella rapi, and that's why we have such a, a surge of Dirotella rapi there. But at the edges, it's really a lot, a lot, it's not representative of what you're seeing in the paddock, and the species are actually very different that you're seeing in the paddock. Now, why is there such little overlap? Well, that's because the, well, particularly the grassy refuges, but all the, the uh, neighboring shelter belts and refuges that we found, the plant fauna, uh, composition was very similar to that of wheat as opposed to canola. We found very little in the way of volunteer brassicas, which I know is not always the case, but certainly where we were uh, sampling, those grassy refuges we were obviously targeting. Now grass has a lot more of similar hosts, uh, host aphids that are using grasses in addition to wheats. So there is that overlap there where they were able to just bounce. You had the, the transition of aphids from grassy refuges into the paddock and back and also those aphid parasitoids would move with them, where you had different aphid parasitoids in the uh, paddocks, canola paddocks, as you had to the edges, because the grasses were hosting a different aphid than you were in the canola paddocks. And of course, a low number of aphids isn't concerning. Leaving aphid hosts, again, encourage parasitoids and predators alike. And this is in the refuge in addition to in the crop. As I've shown you previously, a lot of these aphid parasitoids can host swap. And so they're able to parasitize aphids both in the refuge, non-pest aphids and pest aphids alike. Uh, as I've just said, <laughs> and the same with different crops as well. Uh, and finally, and again, I'm probably preaching to the choir, reducing the usage of harmful chemical applications. Yes, you're controlling your pests, but in turn, unfortunately, you are uh, doing irreparable damage to the, your parasitoid community if you're spraying chemicals that affect it. And I think that will obviously transition on nicely to, to Rob's talk um, after me. But if you're not yet bored, um, this is actually just one chapter of my PhD. This work was actually published last week, which is why I'm presenting it to you now. Uh, it's not a publicly available paper, but if you are interested in reading about it, there are some nice pictures in there. It's not completely boring. Uh, you're more than welcome. It's got a, the taxonomic key in there as well. If you're interested in keying out any parasitoids, uh, you're welcome to contact me. I think Lizzie's going to put in the chat um, my email address, but it's here for you as well. And I'm happy to flick that across. I've also presented uh, my PhD as a whole, um, which uh, had this and some other work uh, in a YouTube presentation. So again, I'm, I think Lizzie's going to post the, the link there for you. Uh, and again, it'd be fantastic if you're able to watch that. 
But I'm going to do a shameless ask before I leave. Um, after I finished my PhD, I came to work at Caesar Australia. I'm now working on a project with green peach aphid and turnips yellow virus with Ben Congdon, who I notice is here today as well. Uh, but as part of this project, we're also offering a free aphid insecticide resistance testing service. And we ask if you have or know of anyone who has green peach aphid that has survived a chemical application or green peach aphid with suspected chemical resistance, or even if you just got other aphid species that were present when there were control failures, if you're able to get in contact with me, uh, again, at the same email address, that would be fantastic. We, um, I can send you details on how to send me a sample. And we offer this resistance testing for the green peach aphid, uh, as I say, for free, um, that we would love to, to undertake. And it's it's win-win. So I'd just like to say a huge thank you. There were a lot of people involved in this project um, and it's fantastic to be able to, to revisit and uh, present on my PhD. It's been a little while now. Um, and yeah, thank you all for listening. Um, I think we're gonna take questions at the very end after Rob's spoken, but I'm happy to take any questions then. Thank you. That's fantastic, Sam. Thanks so much. That's really nice to see that research published and out into the world. So well done with that. Um, everybody, please feel free to write your questions into the text box and we can come back to Sam at the end. And Robert, if you'd like to share your screen now, we can move on to your toxicity work. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. There's my PowerPoint. Uh, cool. Okay. Can we all, we can, is that, that looking like you want, Lizzie? Perfect. Thank okay. you. Cool. cool. Thanks. Well, thanks everyone for being here. Um, yeah, so I'm Robert, um, also from Caesar Australia, and I'm here to talk about <clears throat> work on developing a toxicity guide for natural enemies of crop pests, which includes the parasitoids that Sam discussed, as well as predators. Um, they're the kind of the two groups we're looking at. Um, this is part of the much broader AgPIP project, the Australian Grains Pest Innovation Project. And I do want to just give a small acknowledgement before I start. Um, I've only been in my position with Caesar about two months. So most of the work I'm talking about today is work that was carried out by my colleagues, particularly Kathy Overton, my predecessor in the role before I started on this. So uh, yeah. So, oh, uh, ooh, uh, yeah, there we go. Wait a sec. <laughs> okay, cool. Trying to click through slides while sharing my screen. Um, okay, so I guess the first thing, um, if we're talking about toxicity guide that I need to explain is exactly what is this toxicity guide. Um, basically, what we're looking to produce is, um, is a guide that's accessible to growers and um, agronomists and anyone else working in the industry who want it to be publicly available and kind of easy to understand by for anyone. Um, and we want it to be a guide that outlines uh, the impact of commonly used uh, insecticides and miticides in the grains industry on the, uh, the key natural enemies within that. Um, it's going to be focused around a table that will look something like what we've got on the screen here. This is um, from a similar guide produced by the cotton industry. Um, ours will probably be similar to this, but not exactly the same. Um, and what it um, what you can see there is that um, basically it's a, it's a matrix with on one axis you've got um, the relevant chemicals, so on the vertical axis here, and then on the horizontal axis you have <coughs> relevant groups of natural enemies and the kind of cells where those meet will uh, give a ranking as to the, um, the toxicity of the chemical from low, so basically no mortality, up to, up to very high, um, so close to 100% mortality. Um, and so I guess the next question to discuss is why are we developing this? Um, obviously, as, as you'd all be aware, and as Sam discussed as well, um, Insecticides and miticides are basically the go-to tool for pest management within the grains industry. And they're certainly a very useful tool, um, but their widespread use is in some ways unsustainable. So um, we're seeing things like, um, as a result of their widespread use, we're seeing things like es escalating resistance issues. Um, and this is something else that many of my colleagues at CESAR are working on as part of the, uh, the Ag Pit project, trying to um, uh, map out and predict where resistance to insecticides is evolving. Um, we're also seeing things like secondary pest outbreaks, which Sam also touched on, which is the situation you'll find where farmer will go out and spray the crop for a pest, all good, you kill that pest, but maybe you also killed a natural enemy that was there um, that you maybe didn't even know about that was controlling a third organism. And that third organism wasn't the pest while that natural enemy was there. But then once it's wiped out, suddenly this 
this completely new pest springs up. And so we've got, um, yeah, got a new pest outbreak as a result of controlling the first one. Um, and there's also, I guess, another reason why we need to slightly shift the paradigm of, um, of insecticide use is that there really is growing interest um, both amongst growers and the community at large in moving into integrated pest management strategies. Integrated pest management basically means any, any pest management strategy that uses um, multiple techniques. So instead of using just a chemical control, it might involve using chemical controls combined with biological control or cultural control or something like that. And obviously farmers would love to uh, be able to use less pesticide um, for economic and environmental reasons and others. And consumers, um, uh, uh, I guess, uh, there's a growing interest amongst consumers in, in um, products that have had less insecticides and such applied to them as well, both for environmental reasons and perceived health benefits as well. So all of this means that we need to kind of shift to a more sustainable use of insecticides. Um, and this could involve um, more strategic use of insecticides. So it could mean shifting from, say, um, a calendar-based spray program where sprays are used in a prophylactic fashion to one where sprays are only used um, it, in where monitoring is carried out and sprays are used in response to uh, pest insects reaching a particular threshold, or one where we are uh, use an understanding of insect phenology and monitoring of weather and things like that to time application of insecticides. It can also, a more sustainable use of insecticides can also involve the use of more selective insecticides. And that's really where this toxicity guide comes in. So as I mentioned a moment ago, there's a couple of existing toxicity guides out there already. There's the cotton pest management guide that I kind of showed you a sample of. Um, and there's also one that was produced just last year for the vegetable industry by Hort Innovation. Um, and both of these are really popular amongst their respective industries, which is um, part of why we've started working on this one. Um, and we've been able to take some data from these and they're really good guides, but um, we're doing some things differently to them as well. Um, to talk about the cotton guide first, it's, it's a really useful guide that's updated annually, so it makes sure, makes sure it stays relevant. Um, but it's primarily based on field trials. Um, now, field trials are obviously uh, a very realistic way of, of looking at insecticides in the way they're going to be applied, but there's an awful lot of variables involved in them. The actual natural enemies and pests present can change year by year, weather can be different, that type of thing. So um, while, while field trials are useful, we've decided to, um, to go with um, laboratory trials initially that follow international organization of biological control protocols. The reason we really want to do this is because we really want the results in our guide uh, to be as uh, the, the results of our research to be as comparable with other research as possible. This means, for example, that the guide will be able to maintain its relevance. So if uh, a new chemical comes on the market in a couple of years, um, someone can look at the IOBC protocols and the protocols we used as well, um, and carry out, carry out, basically replicate our, start, our methods using this new chemical and then be able to easily compare this new chemical to the existing chemicals on the market um, and, and the, the existing chemicals that we looked at. So we wanna make our data as comparable as possible. Um, and we're also gonna make our raw result, uh, our, our data as publicly available as possible too. The vegetable guide does follow IOBC protocols. Um, and thus, once again, there was some useful data in there for us, but also um, a lot of the chemical application rates and such that are used in grains were quite different. And so it's for these reasons that we've, um, yeah, set out to make, uh, I guess, make our own guide for the grains industry separate from these two um, existing documents. So um, as I showed you a minute ago, the guide is gonna be focused around a table, which will have uh, chemicals on one axis and beneficials on the other. So the first step to making the, the guide was to work out what should be on those two axes. So we went and undertook, um, we, we reviewed the literature, both academic and gray, and uh, undertook substantial consultation with the grains industry with chemical companies and the like, um, and came up with this list you see at the top of the key chemical active ingredients that uh, that we needed to gain an understanding of. Um, and 
we um, uh, when we do this as well, um, those of you who are, I guess, keen and follow follow chemical registrations closely might notice that the last two on the list, flumicanid and acidopiopren, um, have only recently been uh, registered for use in grains, kind of in the last few months. But um, this was kind of in, in trying to make sure our document stays relevant. We um, even though we started working on this a year or two ago. Um, in our discussion with the chemical industry, we, we came to understand that these were in the process of being registered. So I um, started working with them um, a couple of years ago when we started and now they've now they've just become relevant. And so luckily we've got all that data there to um to, to put into the guide as well. So I guess try, trying to trying to keep as, as as ahead of things as we possibly can. We also, of course, needed to work out what natural enemy groups were relevant, and we did the same kind of thing to work that out. Um, as Sam mentioned, there's a fair degree of, um, there, there's not a lot known about a, a lot of the most important natural enemies in Australia. So we've basically categorized the natural enemies into broad groups that you can see in bold. And then there's some examples um, of the specific uh, organisms that uh, we're looking at within those groups following that. So this gave us this lovely uh, big blank table full of lots of possibilities to start working on. Um, and so the first step then was to see what data have other people got already. We didn't want to go reinventing the wheel if there was already um, some good quality data out there. Um, and an initial literature review allowed us to um, fill in some of the gaps in that table. So these are rankings from uh, as I think I mentioned earlier, from low, um, a low impact being basically no, no mortality up to um, a very high impact, so close to 100% mortality. Um, that's good, there's some data out there, but as you can see, there's plenty of white space in the table. So this is where we started to, uh, started to carry out our own research. As I mentioned, we're focusing initially on laboratory bioassays, um, and we carried these out using this device you can see here, which is called a Potter Tower. Basically, this is um, the device, and it's kind of it, it, it's the I guess the the gold standard um, uh, that's used in the um, the IOBC protocols that we're trying to follow. Um, and basically, what it allows us to do is to apply a um, a set volume of a liquid to a set area. In this case, that area will be a petri dish. Um, and by calibrating this machine, we're able to apply an amount of um, amount of a liquid per square centimeter of that petri dish that will reflect the amount that would be sprayed per centimeter per square centimeter in the field if a farmer was applying um, a, chemi a, a chemical out there in the field. So it allows us to more or less replicate what's going on out in a field in the laboratory. So we've used, um, we've gone through and started using all the chemicals I showed on the previous slide, and we're using them at both their, their maximum registered field rate, as well as um, we're looking at them at 10% of that maximum registered field rate as well. This is because we want to be able to, I guess, give farmers as much information as possible. We want to be able to, for example, say, say we see a chemical at its maximum rate, um, is fairly destructive to a type of natural enemy, but is much less so at a lower rate. Maybe um, there'll be circumstances where a lower rate will still control a pest. Um, and so we want farmers to be able to have all that information and have access to those options. So we're, we're spraying, spraying with our potter tower, we're spraying insecticides on the petri dish, and then we're sticking our test insects in them and monitoring uh, survival over the next three days. So obviously looking at acute mortality. And thus far, we've been focusing on commercially available species. So those that can be purchased through integrated pest management suppliers. So that's, uh, that's where we started off with our literature review. And this is where we've gotten to now after most of our assays have been carried out. And so I should just point out that the purple, the purple cells are, are things we've, we've analyzed thus far, but we want to kind of um, have a bit more discussion around them before we, uh, before we make them publicly available. But I, I wanted to include them in there to show that we've, we've filled up most of this table thus far. Um, um, of course, uh, but so yeah, and as you can see, we've we've kind of got the same trend um, uh, that you probably would have expected. So we've got at the bottom of the table things getting um, uh, things getting, I guess, more more nasty to natural enemies down there, and that includes things like the uh, the organophosphates and the synthetic pyrethroids. And then towards the top of the table, we've got more more selective things. Um, uh, biological controls like MPV and BT, as well as various other chemicals that are kind of meant to be focused, uh, that, that um, 
uh, are more selective and focus more on, on specific groups of organisms. Now, there's a couple of um, specific things I want to draw your attention to in the table. These are, these are all quite preliminary results, as I mentioned, but I think there's a couple of things that are interesting there. Um, one of them is uh, this, this column that I've highlighted there of the rove beetles. Um, these are little predatory beetles. Um, and um, I, I guess I just wanted to highlight these because these seem like impressively resilient organisms. Um, as you can see, they are um, everything but a couple of the really the most, the most harshest chemicals has a fairly low um, mortality rate on them. And even um, it looks like uh, even gamma cyatherin, one of the um, I guess one of the strongest chemicals out there on the market has a relatively low impact on them as well. And so this is, I guess, part of the reason why we wanted to develop a table like this, because what this shows is that for farmers who are trying to in, uh, use biological control in conjunction with chemical control, then rove beetles might be one of the, uh, the go-to agents to do that with if they're, um, if they're relevant to the pests you're trying to control. And given that they're commercially available, they're, uh, they're potentially a pretty good choice to use. Um, something else I guess I wanted to highlight is perimacarb. Um, this is generally considered to be a relatively selective insecticide um, and it's often, um, it's often in, um, while, and, and while, um, uh, while there's some variable results that are found in the literature, one interesting thing we found is that it seems to be pretty harsh on, um, on, on parasitoids. Um, as you can see, there's a whole lot of red cells there in the middle, uh, in the middle of the table, which all kind of focus on the parasitoids. Um, and so that's slightly interesting. There isn't a lot of Australian data out there previously. Um, and so it's um, possibly this is something to do with, with, with um, Australian species are potentially more susceptible uh, than, uh, than international species. I'm not really sure. This is something we'll have to analyze further. I also, I also will highlight as well that there's one, one organism, one group of organisms on there that is, um, is highly impacted on this that isn't a parasitoid, that being hoverflies. Um, but once again, this is, this is based on literature from international studies for hoverflies. So we'll have to uh, see, um, uh, see going forwards how, how impactful it is on those. Um, discussion of hoverflies, I guess, brings me up to my next point. Um, and that's, the, I'm sure you'll notice that there's two um, almost blank columns on there, the hoverflies and the carabid beetles. Um, and you'll also notice that right over the other end of the table, the spiders, um, I've got asterisks next to all the numbers there. And that's because um, almost all the spider data we have is based on field data. Um, this is literature review stuff. This isn't uh, stuff that we've done. Um, at this point, we haven't carried out um, any uh, of our own research on carabids, hoverflies, and spiders. And that's because these groups of organisms aren't commercially available. Um, when this brings us to our next step, um, it's, it, we've almost finished all the commercially available species now. So now the next step is to move on to the, uh, the more difficult species, the species we can't just buy from a commercial breeder. Um, we've developed protocols for the field collection and or lab rearing of relevant life stages of these three groups, the hoverflies, the spiders, and the carabids. And as we move into spring and summer, we're going to start enacting them. But uh, this is where I put out my shameless call for help. Um, if anyone works with a farm in Victoria where you've got lots of hoverflies, um, right now they're probably pretty noticeable. They're attracted to yellow flowers with canola blossoming and wattle, wattles blossoming and such. There might be plenty around. Um, if anyone uh, works with a farm like that where they, the farmers might be open to me, uh, coming and collecting some hoverflies, I'd love to hear from you. There's my uh, email address at the bottom of the screen. So um, unfortunately we're limited to Victoria at the moment with travel restrictions, but um, yeah, I'd love to hear from you. Same if you uh, happen to know that you've got a farm that's crawling with wolf spiders, we'd love to uh, get, get hold of them too. So yeah, the next step will be to, um, uh, yeah, test these uh, non-commercially available species and hopefully have that table completed um, by the end of this year and out there and ready for consultation and then eventually publicly available to the industry by early 2022. Um, with that done, that's certainly not the end of the project though. Um, uh, I guess understanding the acute toxicity of these chemicals to um, to key natural enemies is only one small part of, of the subject of, I guess, um, chemical stewardship of these natural enemies. Um, there's many more things we want to look at. Going forward, we're going to um, seek to investigate sublethal effects. So this will be looking at, say, we find a chemical that doesn't necessarily kill many organisms of a specific species, but they could still be harmed uh, even if they don't necessarily die as a result. And so we'll be looking at whether chemicals affect things like reproductive output of organisms affected by it, um, 
sex ratio of, of, of their offspring or um, potentially their efficacy as pest control agents. Um, also, we've obviously only spoken uh, thus far about uh, chemicals that are applied as foliar sprays. Um, and of course, seed treatments are an important part of um, uh, insecticide use in the industry there as well. So we're going to move on to start investigating uh, seed, seed treatment effects in the future. And then finally, while the focus thus far has been on lab studies, um, we will be including some more field realistic trials going forwards if we find studies that we think, um, uh, if we find effects that we think uh, are worthy of more kind of more investigation in a more field realistic scenario. Um, so that's where we're at now with the development of the toxicity guide. Um, yeah, close to close to completing the first uh, the first stage of it, um, but plenty more to go on. And I just want to I guess finish by thanking our partners, um, University of Melbourne Grains Research and Development Council, and I'll um, yeah finish up there and happy to take any questions. Thanks for listening. Thanks so much, Robert. There's one question that's come up from Paul in the chat already. He's asking with that table, did you use the maximum rates or the minimum rates for the findings that are there? Yeah, we used maximum rates, but we also use, uh, so yeah, that, that, oh yeah. So that table was based on maximum rates um, and I've just included that to make it easier to present, but we will include data on uh, reduced rates, which is typically 10% of the maximum rate, or if there's a lower recommended rate in certain crops or certain pests, we'll use that lower rate. Fantastic, thank you. Now we do have time now for questions. Feel free to unmute yourself and ask um, that way, or you can write into the text. Um, we can hang around for a couple more minutes for anyone that's got questions. Just whilst we're waiting on uh, questions, I realized I forgot to uh, mention a question that was asked uh, to me uh, previously uh, by Adam. It was actually through, um, through Adam by somebody called Dorothy. He said, even with little mummies visible, parasitism can be quite high simply because the mummy is only the very last stage of wasp development. Do you know any forecasting, modeling, predicting done on total parasitism estimates based on number of mummies per square meter or centimeter? Um, and I can say, yes, I do. <laughs> um, part of my PhD also looked at this. And um, in the uh, chat where there's the link to my video on YouTube, I do briefly mention this. This is actually a bit of a work in progress in terms of writing the paper, but we did look at observed uh, parasitism based on mummies in the, in the field uh, with actual parasitism, which was based on the wasps that we reared in the lab, which is obviously not completely representative of of the actual parasitism, uh, but we were looking at that and seeing if it was representative and the answer is, is no, um, but there's a lot, a lot more to it. So um, I'd say if, if you are interested in knowing that, I don't think I can see Dorothy's name here, but if she does watch it later, um, she can watch the YouTube um, and it will be coming out as a paper. And I think it would be a great discussion in a future um, presentation actually. Um, to talk about so and there is also a paper uh, by Barton et al um, 2021 uh, which I was involved with, which actually took some of the data from my PhD and she did a modeling paper for forecasting uh, the the effects of uh, aphids and parasitoids uh, with climate change so that's also another interesting read which again happy to share if you want to flick me an email thanks very much Sam that's great Lewis, is that a hand up? Would you like to ask a question? Oh, thanks, Lucy. Hey. Uh, yeah, and thanks, Sam and, and Robert, for excellent presentation. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Um, very well done. Um, Robert, I had a specific question. It, it drew my attention in the table, which is fascinating, uh, this interactions between agrochemicals and beneficials. Yeah. Um, at the extreme right of it, you had the levels, right? It was low, medium, high, and very high. Yes, that's correct. And so maybe that's just my ignorance, but could you just delve a little bit on why the threshold? So like why is low 30 and then there seemed to be a medium category that was pretty broad 30 to 80? Yeah, uh, those are actually the categories that are used by the International Organization of Biological Control, and we're just trying to match them. So um, yeah, I, don't, I don't have a, actually particularly great insights onto why those were chosen. Um, but yeah, we're just, we're just trying to um, be as compatible with IOBC protocols as possible. 
So, so sorry, that's not an interesting answer. I guess go ask the IOBC. It's pro probably written probably somewhere in their protocols. Yeah. Yeah. No worries. Thanks for that. It is quite fascinating, though, um, building on that, that you have got that wide range in the middle. But I noticed a lot of the results were, um, are are either low or very high. Mm, so even, mm. even having that wide range in the middle doesn't seem to have a, a bias towards it. Which is yeah, yeah. And that, and that could be why they have such a wide range. It could be just past experience showed that that's, it was a kind of a bimodal distribution, um, so to speak. And yeah, <laughs> kind of, well, let's not waste space in the middle. Let's just go. Well, because yeah, very, very high is just is greater than ninety nine percent mortality. So it's a it's a very narrow band, but it's a it's a band that a lot of things can fit into. So, yeah. I'll just pop in quickly, Sam. I know you spend a lot of time out looking at these parasitoids in the crops. Do you have any tips for people who would like to observe them or would like to see them in their own fields, or to give some kind of advice on how you can? maybe not get an exact monitoring measurement of them, but just to, to see them in action? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, it, to see the actual adult wasps is actually surprisingly tricky. They usually inform when you've got your huge canola crops where they're flowering and it's a nightmare if anyone's trying to wander through them. It's a bit of a nightmare trying to get through them alone, uh, but they're usually on the lower leaves. So they're wandering around there. I mean, they're fascinating to watch. So if anyone's got a spare, spare 10 minutes, I guess we all do nowadays in lockdown. Um, you know, you can watch them wandering on the lower leaves. So that's usually where you'll find mummies as well. Green peach aphid particularly have found on the lower leaves. Um, so if you take the, the leaf and it's on the underside is usually where you'll find the mummy. So the wasps wandering around there is because they're foraging, looking for, for the, uh, the mummies to, sorry, the aphids to, to oviposit within. Um, but obviously then you have your, your cabbage aphid and your turnip aphid, but mostly cabbage aphid, usually in the florets at the top. Um, and so if you're looking for, for mummies up there, usually that's the cabbage aphid and they're parasitized at the top, but you never tend to find parasitoids. I mean, maybe other people have different, um, different views on this, but I've never really found parasitoids wandering around plants at the top, usually on the lower leaves. So, um, yeah, trick, pretty tricky to find. But if you if you grab yourself a mummy, you can chuck it in a petri dish at home, and uh, <laughs> you'll rear a wasp out within a couple of days. Start your own parasitoid experiment. <laughs> That's a great idea. <laughs> um, we've got a couple so, of questions. So, uh, oh, got a couple so of... sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Paul has written a question in the chat. Do aphids have any beneficial positives in our crops? So I guess there's that idea that you need a couple of aphids in order to actually entice the parasitoids in in the first place are there any other and any other benefits for having aphids in a crop oh god <laughs> um not really i don't think um no i mean they do entice those those beneficials like you say and and particularly the generalist predators i mean they're, they're great for everything right they're, they're good for other pests as well so i think certainly having a low number isn't a problem it's not necessarily beneficial, but it's certainly not, not a problem for your crop. Um, and I think it's almost to be encouraged to have a small number. Um, but no, I can't really see them bringing benefits as such. Yeah, thanks very much, Sam. That's great. There's a couple more questions coming through, which is really great. Um, have any differences in parasitoid abundance between farming systems in particular been um, discussed? So high crop pressure, high crop pasture plant diversity versus monocultures. Yeah, so I think this is one for for Sam looking at the different and the far, difference in the farming system. Did you use any of those kind of variables in your research? So whether there's lots of remnant bushland around, whether the insecticide use was high or low, and whether that affected the numbers of parasitoids you were finding. So we didn't look at the sort of the ecosystem as a whole in terms of um, the different crops and things we had out there. Um, it was we just didn't have enough time um, to do. It was a relatively short study. I did look at um, sprays, sprayed crops versus unsprayed crops. But again, unfortunately, because it was such rigorous sampling, I only had, I think, six paddocks in total um, during the one year of really um, constant sampling that I was doing. And so I think we only had one that had a lot of sprays on. Um, everything was seed treated. Um, so that in itself was, was some information but we did find that the the sprayed crop certainly had a different composition of parasitoids but it was too hard really to draw a conclusion from that as it was just the one crop but um there's certainly studies out there to do with monocultures and and varying plant composition and and generally speaking um if it's got a, a lot of different plants it's better 
um, because you, you're covering the different uh, aphids and therefore the different aphid parasitoids associated with it. So I'd say rule of thumb, the more plants, the better. Uh, but it's certainly not something I looked at myself. Yeah, I, I can say just from some research I've recently wrapped up in the US before I started with Caesar, we, we certainly found a lot of differences like that, differences in crop, differences in like vegetation structure and that type of thing impacting on the parasitoid wasp fauna, fauna there. So yeah, presumably it would be the same over here. It would be interesting to do a similar kind of study in, in grains crops in Australia. Oh, I'd, 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 love, I'd love to do it. I'm busy with this at the moment. Though, so. <laughs> we'll let you finish off the toxicity work first. <laughs> <laughs> um, there was a quick question about the white and purple squares in Robert's table, which we'll just say to everyone. I've written in the chat, but um, Robert, as far as I understand, the white hasn't been investigated at all yet, and the purple has been, but is under embargo at the moment. Yeah, more or less. We're just wanting to yeah chat with various people involved and confirm some stuff before but yeah it will all be publicly available once everything's concluded so yeah just work in progress at the moment yeah fantastic okay i think this has been a really wonderful discussion and thank you sam and robert for staying on board because it's really nice to have this opportunity to talk through these ideas with you thanks so much for attending everyone today if you have any more questions you've got sam and robert's email addresses or you could email me as well and we will be sharing this recording online through our YouTube channel so you can refer it on to your colleagues as well if they're interested. Thanks very much. Thanks, Thanks everyone.